The Film Crickets are intended for mature audiences. Any guests on the Film Crickets do not necessarily share the same opinions as the Film Crickets. Film Crickets, chirp about movies. It's time for the Film Crickets with Jay Fortier, Chris Martineau, and Melanie Howerton. On this week's episode, host from the Roll Podcast, Maurice Hunt rejoins the Crickets, and Jay, Chris, Melanie, and Maurice review the 1946 American Christmas supernatural drama film, It's a Wonderful Life. Does it stand the test of time? Let's find out your film crickets are on now. And I believe that scream when he goes, yes, it's, it's mm. like, good, I just found my car that I got into a drunk driving accident with yeah. into a yeah. tree. I'm so yeah. glad Everything's it's still great. there. Oh, yeah. that's so funny. <laughs> oh, well, welcome to the Film Crickets, everybody. My name is Jay Fortier. I'm along with my good friend and co-host, Chris Martin. Hello. Hello. And I am along with my good friend and co-host, Melanie Howerton. How are you doing, Melanie? Good. How are you guys doing? Good. Doing well. <laughs> Welcome back, Maurice. We haven't seen you in a while, buddy. How you doing? I'm doing good, man. Unlike uh, our main character, I was able to leave town, man, and I'm now in Florida, so. <laughs> <laughs> I got <laughs> out. So I'm excited. He yes, got, I got out. out. <laughs> I got out. It's good to be back. <laughs> yeah, man. Excellent. Yeah, we did uh, White Men Can't Jump, and then mm-hmm. we almost did Tin Cup together. Um, yeah, and which he still hasn't seen, and it's by, which you got to see it because it's really fun. <laughs> it um, is good. Yes, I'm gonna watch you guys so I can watch our review on it since I wasn't uh, there. <laughs> right, right. Well, it's, uh, <laughs> to make you laugh here, um, because our, our my friend Steve does the intro, he said, uh, you know, hey, Maurice Hunt will be there. Like, you know, like you know, it was part of the thing, and I wasn't gonna have him redo it, so we were just gonna explain that you weren't there and then so we started off after like you know he said hey maurice hunt and i was like we both went maurice <laughs> maurice <laughs> oh so y'all like, built a bit on it that's good no, that's just really good. doing what we could do yeah yeah just <laughs> built on it yeah so we are uh we're breaking format by about uh 34 years or so um with today's episode it's it's a wonderful life um it, it what i don't i forget i'm sorry i have a swiss cheese brain why did we decide on something from three decades, three and a half decades previous to our <laughs> niche? Not that I care. I'll do whatever. But who, who's um, I, I want to thank whoever his idea this was. So it's whose idea was this? Are you, you, Maurice? Was this Jay? Like, what happened? Why are we breaking <laughs> format not. by three and a half decades? I'll let him explain uh, it if he if he wants. Yeah, Go I had some it. other Christmas movies in mind, and some other things were already taken. And so uh, a buddy of mine that we re- we podcast together, he was talking about how this is his favorite movie. Okay. And uh-huh. he had told me to watch it last year, and I didn't watch it. So then all of this started to happen again. I was like, oh, I'm linking up with the guys again. Um, and I was like, okay, this might be a good opportunity. Now I have to watch it. And so okay. that's kind of the the origin of how we got to this, po- this point. All right, that's, that's cool. I, I'm into it. Um, so usually we go around and say, what's your history with this movie? And say, I, I mean, I saw it in theaters when it came out, so... <laughs> um, I don't know if you guys know, but I got oh, in my wow, TARDIS. Good, man. Yeah, I got my good. TARDIS, and I set it to 1946, and um, I went back. Um, no, uh, so so you know, you go around. So so Maurice, you never you never sat down and watched the movie ever. ever. Um, you you right. knew it was there. You knew there were scenes from it, right? Uh, I may have seen it in passing at some point, like pieces and parts but i may have confused it with twilight zone oh fair enough <laughs> uh, that is fair it does have the same kind of energy at the end there's no doubt about that um it and does. twilight zone yeah. isn't always just grim uh you and the beginning too the be- yeah the beginning as well all right um okay so so obviously no one saw it in the theater um i can tell you my story with this and um let's go with, with melanie like melanie when's the first time you actually sat down and watched this beginning to end <clears throat> do you watch this every year do you like what's your deal no, I don't watch it every year. I should. I, I think I own it. Um, okay. I'm pretty, you know, I know I own it because when the kids would be like, oh, you know what? I don't feel good today. I can't go to school. I was like, okay, well, you know, that's fine, but you're not going to be in your room. You're going to be on the couch and we're going to watch movies that I know I could never make you watch. I may have them watch like classic movies. Like, okay. It's Clockwork Orange. And, like, Full Metal Jacket, no. Clockwork Orange, yeah. that sort of thing. All right. 
No, it's more like it's a wonderful life and Miracle on 34th Street okay. and like the Shirley Temple Little Princess, like stuff that was like black and white or something that I knew I would never get them to watch any other time and they had to be forced to do it. Okay. If you want to stay home, that's fine, but you're going to stay on the couch, you're going to watch these movies. Okay. So um, I, 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 didn't, I haven't even really seen it a whole lot of times. I've just seen bits and pieces because when it's on TV, you know, you don't ever get to watch the whole thing. It's just whatever's there mm -hmm. growing up, you know what I mean? Um, but... Uh, I have, I have to say, I think I enjoyed watching it this time above mm -hmm. any other time because I just really sat down and paid attention to every little thing of it. So, okay. You know, it was a different experience, I think. It's something. Jay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's your deal? I, um, <clears throat> it's one of those movies I saw, like, not – I didn't actually watch it. It was always this thing that was on either in the background. Um, it was always already in the middle of it. I never want to jump in. Mm -hmm. Especially if something is, you know, re revered. I don't want to, like, jump in the middle. Like, I want to see it mm -hmm. from the beginning. And, you know, when I was a kid, I couldn't have probably appreciated this at all. Like, no. you know, because, you know, so I'm actually really psyched that I didn't watch it until I was, like, I want to say late 20s, early 30s. Okay. Yeah. I, and I loved it. Yeah. I, I think I'm in the same boat. Like, I knew it existed. Um, I knew a couple of lines from it every time a bell rings, an angel gets swings. And yeah. uh, Mary, Mary, I think the only my first super exposure to it was the SNL skit where they actually have the lost footage from It's a Wonderful Life. And oh um, somebody finds out that old like someone comes back back and says they, they basically restage the end. It's Dana Carvey as Jimmy Stewart and Dennis Miller comes in as his brother. And then somebody says, hey, we just found out Mr. Potter had the money the whole time. And Dana Carvey in his in his best uh I'm sorry, Blinken uh, is best. Uh, uh, Jimmy Stewart. Jimmy Stewart, I'm sorry. Goes, wow, let's get over there and kick his ass. And they go <laughs> over to Potter's and they beat the shit out of him. Um, <laughs> which I thought was just one. That was a William Shatner episode of SNL. You should uh, you should watch it. But I'm in the same boat. Like, I, I knew it existed. I, I certainly wouldn't have given it the time of day because it's black and white. And black and white is, quote, boring. Um, but then you get older and you, and you watch it and... The first, I can't remember the first, probably early 30s, maybe somewhere around there. And you watch it, and at that point, you've had enough life experience to be at least be able to identify with Jimmy Stewart. Not the same, yeah, you know, post-depression, post-World War II depression era America is not the same. We don't have the same lessons now as from then, but certainly his life experiences maybe you can little bits of you can identify with george bailey maybe not everything but some of it and some of the things that maybe he's going through and the things that have gone through your head and so i certainly appreciate it and i love this movie so much and i challenge myself to not cry at the end and i always friggin do uh, and i don't watch it every year though i want to i actually on purpose skip it so that it actually is meaningful the next year yeah so this is my off year for It's a Wonderful Life. I actually did not rewatch it because you didn't. Uh, I didn't because I know it. I've seen it. A, yeah. I've seen it a lot. I don't need to rewatch mm -hmm. it. Um, yeah. It's like uh, other movies we've seen because it's my off year. I watched it last year, so I can't watch it this year. I'm going to watch it next year um, oh because I want it to mean something. I don't want that feeling to go away, and mm -hmm. so I'm so scared of it going away because I'll know it's coming up. So I give it a break. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's and I, I do the same thing. I'm sorry. I go off years with White Christmas. Um, and I just saw White Christmas today, this year's rotation on the big screen. I went to go see it at the Alamo. And it's it's something. It's hokey. It's dated. It's all that stuff. But boy, it's, it is an experience to see in, in vivid Technicolor. But this movie is not in vivid Technicolor. It's in black and white. So um, anyway, let's uh, let's get into uh, it's Wait, wonderful. I have a question. What? Uh, Maurice, did you see it in color or black and white? They have this in color? No, they colorized no, it. it. Yes, but it's they it's colorized it, it. Yeah, so like you you so I'm I'm psyched to hear that you you saw the original because that's that's the way it's meant to be. Mm -hmm. Like in like it's a lot of people remastered like, though the version I seen I don't know. Oh, it's it, clean, it really good. Like it was really yeah. clean. I don't know if that's the original. No, they, they probably have cleaned it up. I just like you know a lot of people like really get it. It's like I don't know if it was Ted Turner that did it. But it was, a lot it was, of people. It was Ted Turner. Yeah, he bought the they, rights. Like basically, he, they, yeah, they painted every frame of the movie with yeah, and they made it look like it was in color because they assumed well, no one wants to see a black and white movie, so they colorized it. It was like the first thing they ever colorized, and it's miserable. Oh, it's bad. 
Well, it's just weird. Like it's you know, bad. I mean, like it's yeah, it's it's better off this way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Ooh, well, okay. So uh, so let's get into it. Uh, never heard this movie referred to as supernatural before. That thank was you, funny. St- thank you, Steve Lavoy. Uh, all right, so here we go. So it's a wonderful life. Uh, came out. It's uh, two hours and ten minutes long. Nineteen forty-six rated PG. That was the only other rating there was besides G back in the day. Uh, an angel is sent from heaven to help a desperately frustrated businessman by showing him what life would have been like if he had never existed. Directed by Frank Capra, written by Fran- uh, Francis Good- Goodrich, Albert Hackett, and Frank Capra, starring uh, Jimmy Stewart, Donna Reed, Lionel Barrymore, who's fantastic, Thomas Mitchell, Henry Travers, and a bunch of people that were born in the 19th century. Um, so that's it. That's It's a Wonderful Life. So before we get into the serious context of the movie, let's get the big debate, and I'll go with, Nor- uh, with Maurice first. Um, is Die Hard a Christmas movie? <laughs> I tell you what, I felt that way about this movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I felt that when you said right there, I was like, okay, all right. <laughs> we not, we can't just, oh, last minute we're gonna classify this as, so no. no. So so uh, you you see where I'm going with this? Die Hard is not a Christmas yes. movie. It just takes place in the framework of Christmas. Jay, I don't want to hear it. I don't care what they said. No, 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 I know. I know. I'm just kidding. We you and to... I both agreed oh, on we, the No, episode. no, no, no. But then didn't, didn't we have the podcast where they said, like, the writer said it's a Christmas movie or some, some shit? I forget what it no, was. No, we. Oh, we totally we. agree. No, no, no. I know. I'm not saying. Yeah, I was like, I was like, what are you doing to me? Nah, screw you, I, friend. I like... um, so, so <laughs> Die Hard is not a Christmas movie. It's just the framework of the movie. And It's a Wonderful Life is not a Christmas movie. Um, it's just that do we agree that the payoff makes it a hundred times better because it's at Christmas? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know what? Because of the debate, I just wanted to say, I checked uh, uh, what time was left in the film when they arrived on the Christmas time, mm-hmm. and there was still fifty three minutes left in the movie. Sure, yep. <laughs> you know, so it wasn't, it wasn't as like like they didn't bookend it so much that it was like the last ten minutes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like yeah. at least it like some of it was. You know. Yeah. But yeah. I understand. Yeah. I I wouldn't. I'm not going to debate anybody that says it isn't. You know. I I would maintain that the, the movie, and we'll get into some of the the things about it. I maintain that the the movie is has to be done at Christmas because if you are George Bailey or you feel like George Bailey or you are even mentally ill, um, George Bailey's not mentally ill. He's just he has a hard time wrapping his head around all the bad things and that that has happened that he feels as though has happened to him. Right, he. Uh, that's what he thinks. And the fact that you are in the middle of all this joyfulness, but you have this thing inside of you that you cannot. You want to be joyful, but you feel better feeling bad about yourself. Makes it worse. It's not any other day. It's not like you know we went to a football game and everybody was cheering and I was miserable. It's Christmas. Like it's supposed to be love and joy come to you and to you your wassail too. It's it's joyful. Well, this joy, 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 joy ran down your throat. And you don't want to feel joy. You want to hang on to feeling bad. And that makes it worse and better. I feel as though, like, you have to have this. The payoff is at the end. It's not a Christmas movie. But I can see why they do it at Christmas. Right? Or am I nuts? Yeah. I mean, it's... it's yeah, like... I'm nuts? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. no. It, it, I, I mean, I guess, though, I think with the... Kind of with the angel concept, I think it does lean to work better in having that as a, a backdrop mm-hmm. i don't know if this was just a regular in the summertime he's going through all of these things and an angel comes and he, he has to have kind of the you know the ghost of christmas past concept without the actual holiday sure. i don't know if it works as well so i, I would agree i think that you do need it mm-hmm. I, I think when it's it's tough when you're in such the strait that george is in it's tough it makes it worse when everybody around you is trying to be happy Right. And and let's think about George's mentality. He feels this town. He has made it so that the town, everyone in the town can be happy, but him. Mm -hmm. He has sacrificed his life for the savings for the building and loan so that people couldn't live under Potter's umbrella. And everybody is able to be successful and fruitful and get what they want. An entire town of people gets to have what they want because George has sacrificed everything that he wanted to do. And he, how, like, that is the humanity of George Bailey. 
he doesn't complain about i think it's a very real thing he doesn't complain that he he is a good man is george bailey a good man everybody let's yeah, put that out there yeah. is, is he a good man a hundred percent he's a hundred percent a good man however he has these feelings inside of him like he wants to be selfish and who doesn't who doesn't but i'm so <laughs> glad you said that yeah i'm psyched you said that because i was i was before i even watched it today i was just thinking about it leading up like mm -hmm. to this uh for a couple of weeks you know i was like you know i think he wants to be he, but he's too good of a person to be mm -hmm. like you know what i mean like every time uh, like for instance when they're like well when they offer him the job as the secretary, the executive secretary of mm -hmm. the building and loan, he's like, no, you know, uh, Uncle Billy, he's your man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. they're, and they're like, no, and like, and they're like, they'll vote, they'll vote with Potter otherwise, bong, and the music stops. And mm -hmm. it's like, you know, it's like, of course, I'm going to stay now. Like, mm -hmm. uh, everything. And I mean, the honeymoon, he's about to go on his honeymoon. Mm -hmm. And he goes inside the, the thing just to go, like, see what he could do to get everybody together no no don't go go don't go to potter <laughs> you yeah. know because they're like he's gonna pay 50 cents on the no, dollar no, no, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like what the hell oh man but but, so, even, yeah. but even then like he's the the town has his back even when he doesn't get to have a honeymoon but they stage a honeymoon at his ramshackle house that's by the way, I Tripping. mean, who moves Tripping. into that house? <laughs> Melanie, you have this thing about houses. Who moves into that house? I would be fixing it up like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Holy moly. On the honeymoon. But I do yeah, like the, the house. And if it was salvageable, I would totally have bought it 100%. Okay. Because it's a nice house. It's a really nice Even house. Even though it's got the loose newel post at the top, yeah. which is indicative of his life, right? Like, it looks yeah. perfect, but really things are falling apart. Think, oh my God. Think about that for a minute. George thinks up until he decides through no fault of his own, everything is going to come crashing down on him. Uncle Billy screws up and then he screams at Uncle Billy. And by the way, does he, again, he's so human. Does he love Uncle Billy? Yes. Of course. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. deep down, does he think Uncle Billy's kind of a dope? Of course. Of course he does, because Uncle Billy is kind of a dope. He's got, what's his pet? He's got a bird or some shit. Raven. Yeah, Uncle He's got Raven. A lot of things. Not yeah. a normal thing, folks. I'm sorry. Most people don't have a raven as a pet. But the fact of the matter is, like, deep down, he thinks Uncle Billy's a dope. Otherwise, he would have had Uncle Billy run the, the building and loan. So he, not that he can't be trusted, but he would probably ruin it. So deep in the back of his head, Jimmy Stewart is like, he, I, you know, Uncle Billy's going to mess it up. And for so long, when finally Uncle Billy messes it up, that piece of his humanity comes out and he screams at this nice old man and calls yeah. him an old fool because you know what? He's been thinking that since day one and every day he wakes up and he's like, no, Uncle Billy's a good man. He's probably going to, you know, he's got his problems, but luckily he's not in charge. I am. I'm going to trust him to do this. And all of that comes out. And who hasn't done that? Who hasn't done that? Everybody's done that. So we can identify with George Bailey on so many freaking levels. It's crazy. It's crazy. It kind of reminds me of Michael Douglas on, in Falling Down. Oh, sure. Because he is just like, he always wanted to leave. He never planned on staying. Like, he couldn't wait to just get out of that town. One thing happened after another that he just couldn't leave. But I think he always planned on maybe he could leave one day or something. And then just everything just starts to unravel. Mm -hmm. And it's just a little bit more and more. And then when he realizes that he's going to literally not have any money for his family, for the town, for anybody, like he just can't handle it anymore. Mm -hmm. But you know, like, but he also he's unraveling. <laughs> but but and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong and anyone can jump in. He yeah. is he thinks that it is all because of him because he helped the whole town. If mm -hmm. he feels as though he messes up once, then everyone is going to, like, he's going to ruin everyone's lives. That's is why he, he felt like he was better off dead. Like, if, not dead, but never born. Because he thought everybody was better off without him if he was never born. But is that rational? Maurice, is that a rational thought? Is the town actually doomed because of this no. one thing? What do you no, think? I mean, he... No, he just had, based on what we've seen, he just had a lot of heavy traumatic experiences that 
with the old man and the the poison and the mm-hmm. you know the, 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 the little brother scene and the beginning it's so many traumatic these are huge moments that are happening so it's like he's carrying that weight like if if I'm not there to save if I'm not there to do these things mm-hmm. they will fall apart because of the experiences that he's had yeah. up until that point even to the you know the bank situation when everybody came in and the whole Potter you know the whole Potter uh situation so it's he carries that because he's just happened to have those those scenarios in front of him but i think that he has a little bit of fomo which is kind of <laughs> an underlining theme okay. throughout uh the movie like yeah. i just think that it's that idea that it's greener on the other side i'm missing i'm missing out on something mm-hmm. yeah. and you know of course we we'll, we get to the end we'll talk a little more about it but it's that idea that we all find ourselves in i just recently moved to florida like a year and a half ago and so i have those moments internally of like man should I have done this? Was this the right move? I love it here, but I miss my family so much. I miss my people mm-hmm. so much, but I'm here, and I love it here, too. And so you you really never know until you do that, but I, I love how they kind of tie it all together at the end. But, yeah, it's it, it, his experience would lead him to believe that if I don't do this, it's going to fall apart. No, or And the fact that it's mixed together with I I could have been, I could have done that, but I can't. But he, those are his choices. He made choices. Yeah. When like, he's seeing everybody else like make the money that he could have made, yeah. or even when he was offered to make it and he didn't make it, or, and had the life that he really wanted, traveling, money, or, all that. Or he could have been a war hero, right? His brother became the war hero. He saved his brother and then lost his hearing. So then he couldn't become a war hero. So he had the same, he couldn't serve. So it's almost like, well, my brother, well, I could have been him. I could have had a parade and 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 had all like people welcoming me back back home, but I've been here the whole time, and he keeps trying to leave and he can't, and it just doesn't. That is so it's so human because that doesn't that that is a that is a cognitive dissonance to think that I you are the one, but we all think that, like we all think that in one way or another we put ourselves in that situation, and that's why we identify with him. Go ahead, Jay. Sorry. No, Melanie, I I can see she's champing at the bit for one thing, and that's to talk about the poison. You know exactly what it was, and I know I'm you, you and your face. We you both started laughing. The same exact thing, because we you know, like when he said poison, I'm like I really I wrote that down in my notes, I'm like poison, like it was just hilarious. Like, he's like at the pharmacy, and there's literally a freaking bottle. Why is there a bottle of poison? And it says labeled poison, and like, and it's in capsules, no less. Mm-hmm. So it's not even like it's going to be like, okay, well we sell you know, arsenic well, back in no, the I think, days for like rat I think he's, or something. It's in a freaking capsule. Why would you have no, poison in a capsule? I think he was adding the, uh, I think he was adding the, the, the ingredients to the capsules. So he made, he was putting it together. You know, obviously today's pharmacy. Yeah. It all gets delivered yeah. prepackaged. Yeah. I think I he was that, actually why putting the stuff. Putting poison in capsules. Oh no, I get it. I don't know why is there. Po- why uh, is that there? I was asking the same question. I uh, yes, and it's to set things up to make it like you know, uh, yeah, to show that that guy would have been the crazy drunk. And I get that. And, and a long a time ago, people sold arsenic for like rat poison and whatever, which mm-hmm. they don't anymore. But you wouldn't, you'd yeah. find it in a box of powder. You wouldn't be finding it where people are putting it in capsules. You're not going to go feed a rat a capsule. Right. A capsule's for human use. Mm-hmm. So why are there, why is there poison in a capsule? Who's going to get that? Like, yeah. That was really cartoony. A little bit. <laughs> but... Yeah, cartoonish. Like he's like Tom and Jerry or something. Yeah, yeah. it definitely right. is like yeah. that. <laughs> but they, they, they set it up to show. Yeah. Like it's a, it's a very emotional moment though. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Like, like yeah. when, when that guy... Now, first off, you when you know what was wrong with him, you know mm-hmm. what I mean. He lost yeah. his kid. Yeah, and he just found he, out af, yeah. after he's you know obviously he shouldn't be hitting a kid. But however, when that's when he finally realizes what George did for him, you, you know, like it's so hard to not get emotional when he mm-hmm. kneels yeah. down and yeah. hugs him, you know, because you know I mean yeah. nobody should ever lose a child. So I mean, like mm-hmm. Man, you know, yeah. I don't know. I can't imagine. Yeah. So like it's like I instantly go like oh my god that's terrible oh that poor guy mm-hmm. you know like so it's like a, yeah, they at, take you through that journey after he slaps the hell out of out of a child but oh, again yeah. he's he's going through the, he's not making he's, he's not, not making, making the right choices um, but he's not an evil person there's no reason for us to... I'm sorry no go ahead what 
when when he had that same time right before that when he was talking to little uh you know the, mary the girl? mary thank you mary he was talking about how like he's gonna go somewhere off to a different country and he's gonna have a whole bunch of wives yes <laughs> Did you get that? yeah he says say <laughs> like, brainless don't you know where coconuts come from yeah, <laughs> yeah. he says it's called horrible. a brainless <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. It's yeah. a, he's he's not uh, you know not, not the most sensitive uh, small child, but you know that's how you well, that's how you flirted back in the day, right? Didn't you like yeah. put gum in the g girl that you likes hair or something like that? I don't know. I don't think that's, not. No, no, um, that's not a good idea, folks. Just dating advice: <laughs> right. don't do that. Um, it's the forties, people. It's no, the forties. It's the forties. Yeah. Right. 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 Um, no, but you know what? Uh, it's also, I could see it being a very, because I always found it to be sort of confusing when he gets like, I tell you what, Mary, and then he starts getting really angry. Mm -hmm. Like, he's like, I don't want any, like, that. and he's it's like, oh, and they just start making out because yeah. like, you talking about the when, phone like, call with, yes, with yes, the, yes, uh, yes, Sam, they call, yeah, I don't want any that? plastics. <laughs> now, I, I think because he's been dying to get out of here for so long, he looks at her as an anchor. Um, he doesn't want her. He does want her, but he doesn't like want to admit that he wants her, right? Mm -hmm. Because she's, you know, like she's going to mean he's sticking around. Mm -hmm. Like, and he's right. like, every time I get so close, uh, I, I got another thing weighing me into this freaking town. Uh, my brother, uh, you know, he just came back and he's being offered a wonderful job from his, you know, his new wife and father-in-law. Yeah. Great. I can't say no to him now. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, and if I go see Mary and I start to get, you know, if I, it's like, I don't want you. Mm -hmm. But he really does. He just can't. That's why he's so pissed when he walks in the door. He's like, yeah. oh, so I'm a joke, huh? And that, <laughs> and that whole scene, and I'll tell you what, that whole scene is so, it's so hard to watch. And because he's acting in a way you don't want to see him to act because you know he's a good man. And mm -hmm. that and the way that she's responding to his aggression. It's so complicated. Like, it's so emotionally complicated that you can't not watch it. It's not uncomfortable to watch, but it should be uncomfortable to watch. You're just watching it going, these two people are very complicated. They have a lot of things going on in their brain, and this is them trying to hash it out. And it is just mind-bogglingly acted so well. How, like, it's so human the way that they're responding to each other. I mean, she says to her mother, is George Bailey down there? Yes, mom. He's ma passionately making love to me or whatever. Like, <laughs> making yes. violent. 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 Oh, yeah, right. Holy moly. For the 40s. But that's, yeah, like, <laughs> that's a complicated thing to say in that moment. Yeah. And it's, boy. She was really, I mean, I know society was a lot different then in many ways, but she was really patient with him. Mm -hmm. She oh, just God. was able to really understand even a moment like that like having that uh you know george will give me the moon and mm -hmm. she was just really patient with him when while we say he's a good man he had certain ways about him that i mean in today's era that probably would be a turnoff it's sure. like, like okay i like him i'm attracted to him but he got these moments that really turn me off about him mm -hmm. but i mean in that time how patient she was and was able to see him at at the core of who he really is mm -hmm. and even in that moment I was just thought it was really good. Like mm -hmm. she, she really impressed me. Uh, her acting choices and then just the actual character herself. Just I don't know. I just really, I don't know. This movie has these things that for some reason it resonates in in the the year that we live in. Like for some reason, and I wouldn't think that it would resonate as much as it does. Mm -hmm. No, because it's it, there are these are univ these people are not cookie cutter characters. They are well established, well thought out people that have that have informed emotions that are bringing forth why they act in particular situations that seem very legitimate. They seem very real, not scripted almost like they seem real, like these are real people. And boy, you see ugh, when you see this, is why I can't watch it every year. When you see Jimmy, when you see George's eyes at the end. And when he realizes that everyone has been wiped from the face of the earth and the panic and the anger and the sadness that are all in his eyes, he doesn't, and, and the, I mean, obviously he's shaking and whatnot, but he can read all of that in his eyes. Sorry. The fact of the matter is like, he is, he's saying so much with nothing and we, I, we can identify his pain like in such a, 
Think about it. You 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 can't. You will never because a supernatural thing, as Steve said. You will never have the situation where you can do what George Bailey has been allowed to do. So how do you represent that on screen authentically? Right? But we be- well, I believe what he believes in that moment. And it's cuckoo. Oh yeah. He's so good. He's so good. He's such a good actor. Yep. But I think one of, the, one of the things that hits you too is like, even if you're like, oh my gosh, I wish I was never born. Everybody would be better off without me. No, he's not thinking at that time like, okay, well, if you were never born, not only was his, his brother would have died, but he's all, and all those people would have died, but his kids would never have been born. He never would have met her. His kids never would have been born. He probably thinks that, you know, he, everyone's better off without him until he realizes that Zuzu's petals, petals are not in his pocket anymore mm-hmm. and that his kids are no more and they never will be because he was, he was never born. I think then it really kind of hit him as well at that point. Like, oh my God, what did I do? You mm-hmm. know? Yep. And, and, and it goes to the fact that on your and it, the, this can either excite you, this can make you feel good, or could you feel fill you with existential dread, depending on how you feel in the moment. But you have to remember the lives that you touch, even when you don't think you did. Like just from a butterfly effect situation, the way that you cascade down the influences you've had with strangers with people that you know good and bad right it, on purpose or by accident you know what i mean we all make the right and wrong choices on purpose and on purpose and by accident or maybe you thought it was a good idea at the time but you don't know and so maybe you think you're doing bad but really in the long run you're doing good like you don't you don't know you know what i mean that i like to think about that the student that i you know that i stressed out in my class one time and was like cried at the end of a test. And then I saw them, they came to visit me in after they went to college for a year and they came back to visit and they said, man, am I glad I cried at the end of that test? Because I realized it wasn't really that bad once I saw a worse one. I'm like, mm-hmm. see, like you can't, you don't know, like you feel bad about making somebody cry, not on purpose, but then you don't know what <laughs> dividends, though, I never do that on purpose, but it's like, you don't know what <laughs> dividends that's gonna pay down the road, you don't know. So it doesn't mean yeah. you don't live. You just don't know. Ah, puh. sorry. Yeah, no, you, you you can't put a dollar amount on, you know, value. You right. Know, mm-hmm. The impact. Yep. And yeah. that is what has been shown. I mean, we've all been there before. We've all had, I'd imagine at some point, mm-hmm. dreams and ambitions. We'll look at certain celebrities or artists, whoever we look up to, we say, man, I would like to be somewhere in that position in my field, in my regard. And we look at that as it's so great and it's so awesome. And then we'll see a tweet or we'll see a post, we'll see a video documentary or something. And you realize the sadness that is there. And mm-hmm. when I recognize and see the sadness that is there, it makes me reassess where I am and realize, no, this is actually the value. To be able to see mm-hmm. my child, to be able to be my wife, to be able to be amongst, I can go to a grocery store. You know, I can go down the street. I'm not being mauled. You know, it's it's just mm-hmm. that type of thing that we overlook as humans all the time because we just always think it's greener on the other side. And we yeah. want to put monetary value on those things. But if we would sit back and really assess, we would realize, like, oh, actually, things are pretty good when I really look at it on paper. You know, and I think George... Mm-hmm was going through that often when he was thinking about Mary, thinking about his brother, you know, all of these things. And that would bring that reminder like, oh, I'm not doing anything until obviously the end where it all resonates. It's like, no, your impact means more than what you thought you, uh, uh, the experience of leaving would have been for you. And, and I, I, I just loved like how happy he was to see his car crash. Like that was like, because mm-hmm. yeah. I felt yeah. the same way when I see it. I was like, yes, mm-hmm. yes, blood yeah. is in my mouth. My car is crashed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Burk, really yeah. Burk, my mouth yeah. is bleeding. You know <laughs> he was so name. upset like, about it when it happened, and because he yeah. thought that was like the worst thing ever. Then he saw what could have been the worst thing ever, and he was so happy. Mm-hmm. Like now, that's not a big deal anymore because he's seen worse. I I, yeah. I like it when he he says Merry Christmas to Mr. Potter. And then when he gets and he gets back to his home and he says, "Hey, ho, hello, Merry Christmas, Mr. Bank Examiner. Hey, we're all going to jail. Isn't that great?" And he yes. goes and he yes. tries to find his kids. Like, I don't know. Like, he's he's kind of right. Like, I don't know. That's, uh, I guess so. You know. I mean. So earlier when you were talking about how, like the whole Uncle Billy thing, mm-hmm. um, he, like you know, um, when even though he screams at Uncle Billy and says, "Hey, you know." He, what the hell um he 
is basically also taking the fall because he he says to Mr. Potter, "I misplaced eight thousand dollars." He goes, "Oh, you misplaced it." And he right. Goes, yeah. Like, so he's not saying mm-hmm. Uncle Billy misplaced eight thousand. He still feels responsible. Mm-hmm. Like he's the one. I noticed um, that. Now, this could easily get missed, and I've missed it for many years. I saw somebody write about it once, and I was like, oh, no. Wow, that's interesting. So today I put it on subtitles. Um, and when he's talking to Uncle Billy, he's like, did, did, you know, did you check your house? And he's like, I checked every room in my house, including the room that I couldn't go back into when I lost my wife. And Aww. I'm paraphrasing. So... That could explain a lot of Billy's behavior. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like that he is so distraught that he has never dealt with it properly. Like, you know, that. so he's kind of a, yeah, you know, a a head case. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, or could could be, uh, he probably already was in that direction and Mm -hmm. that, that made it worse, but Mm kind of like, you know, one of those things you don't, you don't always hear because he kind of is. He's saying it's yeah. so upset, and then that's when he, sh- he grabs him and shakes him. Mm-hmm. He's like, listen, yeah. you, you, you fool. Yeah. If anyone's but, going down the wrist, it's you. It's not me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you guys um, realize when he was in, like, you know, the bad area when everybody was chasing him? Like, when he was trying to find everybody and he was talking to people, like, the bartender was so cruel, for one thing, to, like, <laughs> that to that poor old man to, like, he's... They know he's homeless and he's going to go outside and sleep in the snow and almost freeze to death. But they spray him with water and get him soaking wet so he can really freeze to death. Mm-hmm. And then throw him outside and they throw them outside. And like then later on, the cops are shooting at him like with a bunch of people around in the middle of the town with no care for human concern. But the thing is, he deserves to be shot at because he's saying, Mary, Mary, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. and he's like trying to like talk to people. But he, like, why would you shoot at him? He's just he's just trying to. Hey, wait up! Let me talk to you. You know what I mean? Like, oh my gosh, he's crazy. Let's go shoot at him now. He deserves to be killed. You know? Well, he, <laughs> like did, he did punch so the cop weird. though. He yeah. did punch the cop. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He punched the cop yeah. and started running after. So <laughs> was that but, before or after though? I don't remember. Well, wait, when he was chasing Mary or? No, like yeah, like when did they start shooting? He did shooting punch at the him? cop before he started shooting. Yeah. They did. Okay. I think and right there, right at that moment. Okay, and then well, still you don't shoot to kill because that yeah, he's I not mean, yeah, he doesn't right. have weapon on him. But um, and then he's shooting out, and there's people like ducking and stuff, right, right, um, like looking by. <laughs> did you notice what? that the um, Bart and Ernie are the uh, cop and taxi driver, yep. Bart and Ernie? Yeah, yep. yep. And that also they said that like people are building these houses for like five thousand dollars, and that was supposed to be like super expensive. Well, it is back in the day. Yeah, it was very then, expensive. But I was like, Man, I would love to go back in time and steal up some houses for five thousand dollars. Right. No. Um, I, I I personally like the bartender. We we serve. Well, I'm paraphrasing. We've served drinks to drink drunk, and that's what we do. We drink some more. Like when yeah, they, now think about it. Yeah, I've made this connection before. Um, uh, if you've seen Ferris Bueller, Cameron yeah. does a very good impression of that same style when he's doing George Peterson. Oh yeah, like yeah. when he's doing that, he's like you know he's like you're like this is George Peterson. And he's like, For he's like um, yeah, um, and then like you know that same bartender is like you know like we serve hard liquor for, <laughs> for drunks, yeah. yeah, you know whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just kind of funny. It's like very. I wonder if he like you know picked it up from that guy or something, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, let's talk about Lionel Lionel Barrymore. Oh, you mean the devil? Playing... <laughs> yeah, devil dude. incarnate. Yes, dude. <laughs> Wait, there's a moment. That? That's 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 Mr. Potter. Um, okay. <laughs> no, because but he played it brilliantly. Sure. I mean, the yeah. voice they cast him perfectly. Mm-hmm. The voice was amazing. You know, to play that old you know, crotchety bastard that like everybody <laughs> hates in town, uh, rich guy. Uh, the, but how great is the moment when he's offering George the the twenty thousand dollars a year? Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's it's kind of hard not to be tempted. Yes, yeah, a lot of sure. saying all these things. Right? A lot of money, <laughs> you know, when you make forty dollars a week, you know, yeah. and then it, it boils down to ten dollars a week, and he's going to offer you twenty thousand per year. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. a lot of money. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. So like, um, he says that, and then the chair is like ten times lower. Yep. That you're you know like it's a lot lower than the. And then when he, I just love that the moment he shakes his hand, that's when it dawns on him. Mm-hmm. Like I'm doing a deal with the devil here yep mm-hmm. yep and mm-hmm. that posture that would be a, a simpsons that character would... after potter 
Sure. Who? who? Maybe I, I, don't, I don't remember who it was. Mr. Potter. Is it Mr. Potter? Mr. Potter. His name is Mr. Oh, Potter? Uh, yeah. Oh, that's funny. But in The Simpsons? No, Burns. Mr. Burns. Know. Mr. Burns. Mr. Burns. Oh, Burns. Mr. Yeah. Burns. You're right. Sorry, sorry, Mr. sorry. Burns. Yeah, Excellent. Mr. Burns. Yeah. Isn't there a Potter? That would have been $384 a week for him. Wow. If he had took yeah. the deal. Not wow. eighty-four dollars. Yeah. Oh, damn. Damn. damn! I think that's they said money. wasn't it like three hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars a year. Is that right? If it was today's Probably. money, probably. Ooh. Would that be wow. that? Would that be right? That'd be all right. Yeah, come on, that'd be that'd be suitable. It's hard yeah. to, to pass. That'd be suitable. <laughs> yeah, I would say. Um, yeah, Potter is not only is he the devil, but they also make him kind of androgynous. Like he is Scrooge. He doesn't like women. He doesn't like men. He doesn't like anybody. Um, he is not interested in any of that stuff. He's only worried about the money, which is all Scrooge all day long, right? What's so funny? It's the type that doesn't spend it. Yeah, just just just, take just it. accrues it. Mm -hmm. No no uh, offspring. Yep. Not going to do anything with it. Mm -hmm. Just have it. Yeah. Like, the most and up thing. and and um, he seems to not age as well. So he is They're kind of an, same. he's an ageless demon. Um, if you want to think of it that way, but on the with eyebrows that freaking go oh into a God. damn triangle, yeah. <laughs> unbelievable. His eyebrows go like that. Oh, he dude. had so much money, and everybody else was so poor, and he took eight thousand dollars, which is so much money back then, and he had so much money, and everybody had nothing. I just thought he was evil. So well, evil. he's taking the money because he knows it's the end of the building and loan. I know, but he's such an ass. Well, no shit. We're not supposed right. to like him. <laughs> <laughs> I want to find some redeeming value in Mr. Potter. He's not. He's the devil. He is the devil incarnate. That's his right. whole thing. He doesn't even walk. He floats. He doesn't walk. He floats. I mean, he rolls, but it's the yeah. same as floating. He's just, Dude, he wheels in and wheels ground. out. He's, his feet don't touch the ground. Right. Perfect. <laughs> Absolutely. No, another thing. Another thing. He has a... Uh, painting of himself. Yeah. On the wall. <laughs> wow. That's right. Hey, that is... Look, look. If I ever have a mansion, you bet there's going to be a painting of me on the wall. No. I mean, Just come saying. on. Come on. Just saying. Like... That's the only one he likes. There's you only one person, person in this world that he likes, and that's it. A that is person. a special person. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a special yeah, person, all right. Special right. 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 <laughs> in his own mind. Uh, you want to, what, what well, is, uh, you want to talk his about the chair like a, oh, a throne chair though? Wasn't it like some kind of throne chair? His wheelchair? Sure. Yeah, kind of. It's yeah. throning. It was a yeah. fancy wheelchair okay. back then. It was mm -hmm. a fancy okay. wheelchair. Okay. And a silent You're man wooden, pushes you know, him. Back then. Yes. Pushes him around. Yeah. yeah. A, a dude that doesn't talk. Just like, like, right out of Hellraiser. Absolutely right out of Hellraiser. People were dressed like him. Like they said, I didn't write it down, but it said like. His the person who was pushing him around was pretty much always dressed like him, and like I think his chauffeur is one. But all the people that were like on his side were like dressed just like him. <laughs> That's mm, okay. It's interesting. It down, Too bad I, I won't watch it again until next year. I'll have to remember that. Yeah. <clears throat> Jay, what are we gonna say? No, I was saying, do you want to talk about the ending before we go to uh, uh, TMI? Sure. Yeah. Um, the ending is the best thing ever. It's a complete mm -hmm. redemption of all of his thoughts. Um, it is. We go from the absolute, I mean, think about it. The man's about to jump off a bridge because he's had it, right? That, to me, is his, that's his logical end, which doesn't make any sense. It goes against every bit of human condition. You, you're you built to want to survive, but he doesn't want to survive anymore, so he wants to jump off a bridge. And then he wants to, but the moment he sees someone else do it, he must save that person instead. Like, what is it? Right? Even at the end, you're thinking about other people before you. So that's the first part. Second of all, he, he gets his wish and he goes through, he sees what Potterville, that, that Bedford Falls have become Pottersville. And there's a bunch of whorehouses and bars and, and strip clubs and, and it basically goes to hell in a bucket. Um, and it's like Biff's, Biff's uh, world in uh, yeah. Back to the Future too. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> um, but then when he gets it back, the payoff is just... He, the utter dread and sadness in his eyes is culpable and you can taste the panic and fear that's coming through his eyes. And when finally he realizes we go from that to absolute and abject joy of I got it all back and now I'm not, it is, it's, it's, you're right. It's Christmas Carol. It's, I'm not going to, I realize all of this now and it goes back to it and it, it tears me up. And I said this, the, the line, and I, and I said this on my, when I got married to my current wife, 
um, you know, uh, my second marriage and at the, uh, I had a, a thing at my house and I, all my friends were there and, uh, or at least not, not friends, but the people are at the wedding party, I should say. And yeah. I said, um, said no man is a failure who has friends. And yeah. that's, yeah, yeah. that's, you know what I mean? You can fail in your life, but you're never a failure so long as you have friends. And that's because you are allowing yourself to be vulnerable to other people. Um, and that's the thesis of the movie, right? No man is a failure who has friends. And Potter is a failure because he has no friends. Doesn't matter. Um, you know, but. Uh, so I just want to say, like, before, uh, you know, obviously the when the, when the girl starts playing Hark the Herald Angel Sing and then it, it goes into Old Lang Syne, mm -hmm. those those are the two moments like, you know, like the are just like so emotional for me to like to watch. I'm like, oh, especially because everybody's that's when everybody's coming in with all the money. Yep. Um, yeah. Um. But I, it's like before that, I think a great way to sum it up on how he's so thrilled to be back is that he grabs the newel post mm -hmm. and, and as he's going up the stairs, stops and, and accidentally pulls it with him. Mm -hmm. Earlier, he was really pissed about it. Yep. He grabs it and kisses it. Yeah. Yeah. Before he puts it back down. Right. <laughs> yeah. I think it's so great because it's like, it's like, I don't care. Mm -hmm. Like, like, yeah. you know, like yeah. none of this bothers me at all. Yep. Like, you know, I yeah. love you guys. And, you know. Because he sees the bigger picture mm -hmm. and yeah. the value. Yep. Um, Fix a new post. He needed that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is vacation. He, he needed that, though. He, he needed to see what he saw to actually appreciate his life. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people sometimes are not enjoying their life as it's happening, and they're always waiting for something better to come along. Oh, when we, you know, well, as soon as we have the money, we can go on vacation. Or as soon as we do this, we can do that. Or, you know, you're oh, it's almost like sometimes you're waiting for something better to come along, but you're not enjoying life as it's happening mm -hmm. and yeah. then 10 years from now you're going to look back and go oh my god i would give anything to just be back in that situation again when the kids were still in the house if they've already moved out you know what i mean like mm -hmm. just things that you're yeah. not you know you know you're not living in the present time enjoying yeah. every little minute of it because it just goes by so fast and i think he needed to see what he had was amazing that he didn't appreciate until till now yeah it's very zen a lot of times, especially in the era we live in now, we just always think that we're missing out on something or we think that there's something better all the time. And sometimes you already have the yeah. awesome. You already have the greatness, right? Th it's right there a lot of times. And and as flawed as it may be, it's yours. This is your journey, your story, mm -hmm. your your tribe, you know. And so with, with him coming back and realizing with that, you know, the stereo post and just everything that was – put back into place it's like just accepting things as they are because things are just not that bad as we believe they uh, uh as things around us lead us to believe a lot of times it's time for tmi with melanie listen listen to this i am in the bathroom right before the movie starts uh -huh. and i'm in the stall and there's no toilet paper yeah. and mine are at home TMI. in a display case above TMI, my bed my yeah. tmi 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 my friends tmi too much information, too much information. Say don't go there but that's lame now here's melanie with your timeless movie info melanie show us how wonderful it is well, this is kind of sad because they had a very expensive budget of $3.7 million back then, and it only grows 3.3. Um, wow. I hope these people made a ton of money after all this because it was shown so many times on TV. Now that happens. Hopefully they made something mm. off of that. Yep. Um, the gym floor that opens in the middle to reveal the swimming pool underneath was filmed at Beverly Hills High School in Beverly Hills, California, and was real and is still in regular use. Um, it was built in 1939 to 1940. The design was quite progressive and still is considered to be an architectural icon and local landmark. Um, I thought that was really cool. There was, it has also been in some other movies, too. Um, the film is set to take place from 1919 to December 24, 1945. Um, James Stewart plays George Bailey from the age of 21 to 38 um, from the night of the school dance in 1928 to Christmas of 1945. Stewart was 37 to 38 years old during the filming um, from April to July of 1946. And uh, Donna Reed was 25, and she plays Mary from the age of 18 to 35. Um, the set for Bedford Falls was constructed in two months and was one of the longest sets that had ever been made for an American movie. It covered four acres, RKO's Encino Ranch. It included 75 stores and buildings, a main street, a factory district with a large residential and slum area. 
Main Street was 300 yards long, three whole city blocks. The set was <clears throat> made use of 20 transplanted oak trees and for the winter scenes, 3,000 tons of shaved ice, 300 tons of gypsum, 300 tons of plaster, and 6,000 gallons of chemicals. I have more about the snow later. It was made... It made use of sets originally designed from another movie made in 1931, and it had a real working bank, tree-lined center park where pigeons and cats and dogs were allowed to roam the mammoth set to give a real life uh, lived-in feel. <clears throat> because the story covers different seasons, an alternate town set was um, adaptable. Frank Kappa had once driven through Scenic Falls, New York, and this proved his inspiration for this fictional Bedford Falls. Every December, the town holds a Bedford Falls celebration in honor of the film. For the scene that required Donna Reed to throw a rock through the window um, of the Granville House, uh, director Frank Capra hired a marksman to shoot out the, um, the window on cue. To everybody's amazement, Donna broke the window herself because she had played baseball in high school and had a really good throwing arm. Um, Uncle Billy drunkenly leaves the Bailey home. <clears throat> and it sounds like he's stumbling into the, some trash cans on the sidewalk. In fact, a crew member dropped a large tray of props right after Thomas Mitchell went off screen. James Stewart began laughing, and Mitchell quickly improvised. I'm all right. I'm okay. Director Frank Capra decided to use this take in the final cut and gave the stagehand a $10 bonus for improving the sound. Um, during the filming of It's a Wonderful Life, James Stewart was actively suffering from PTSD and depression due to his service in World War II. Stewart told friends that he related a lot of his character to George, George Bailey, some of the scenes where George acted out in anger was considered uh, his, him, like, basically how he kind of felt when he was struggling with his own mental health. Um, while filming this scene in which George plays in the bar, James Stewart was so overcome with grief, he began to sob. Frank Capra later framed and blew that shot up because he wanted to catch that expression on Stewart's face. This is why the shot looks so grainy and compared to the rest of the film because it was actually his real tears. Oh, wow. um, Despite being set around Christmas, the filmed, film was actually filmed during a heat wave, and it got so hot that director Frank Capper gave everybody a day off to recuperate. Films made prior to this one used cornflakes painted white for the falling snow effect, but this, the cornflakes were so loud, the dialogue had to be dubbed in later. Director Frank Capper wanted to record a live sound, so a new snow effect was developed using fomite, a firefighting chemical, soap, and water, the mixture was then pumped at high pressure through a wind machine to create the silent falling snow. 6,000 gallons of new snow was used in this film. The RKO effects department received a Class II scientific um, or technical award from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences um, for the development of this new snow. When Corby's character was asked how much money she needed at the bank when he was trying to give money away to everybody, she replayed $17, which was actually in the script. But just prior to the actual take, Capper took Corby aside and told her to give Stuart some odd number, thinking that it would be funnier. When she said $17.50 to Stuart, he was taken off guard and impulsively just kissed her, which was not in the script. Stuart's spontaneous reply was so genuine that Capra left it in the scene in the final film. According to Robert J. Anderson, um, H.B. Warner was really drunk during the scene in which Mr. Gower slaps young George. Um, it was so real that it caused blood to actually come from Anderson's ear. After the scene was finished, Warner hugged and comforted Anderson. Um, Henry Travers, who played Clarence, also stars in The Bells of St. Mary of 1945 as Horace P. Bogardus. When George Bailey passes a movie theater towards the end of the movie, the film is being showcased. Oh. Um, Uncle Billy's Raven, Jimmy the Raven, appeared in over 1,000 feature films, including... Every Capra film from You Can't Take It With You in 1938, uh, Jimmy the Crow that landed on the Scarecrow and the Wizard of Oz as well in 1939. Um, so that, that Raven we were talking about was literally in a thousand movies. It says a thousand feature films. Um, Mr. Potter is one of the few movie villains whose fate is left unknown by the end of the film after stealing $8,000 and his attempt to frame George Bailey for embezzling the $8,000. This was very unusual for Hollywood film at that time. The motion picture production code, popularly known as Hayes Code, uh, it required that criminals and movies must always be shown to either be punished or made to repent at the end of every film. Um, in the scene at the dance of the high school gym, when George Bailey first sees Mary and approaches her, a young man is talking to Mary, Carl Alfalfa Switzer. 
Alfalfa of the Little Rascals fame was uncredited role of Freddy Othelio. He is also in the scene where he turns the key that opens the gym floor to reveal the swimming pool. Um, actor and producer Sheldon Leonard said in an inter interview that he only agreed to play Nick the bartender so that he could have extra money to buy baseball tickets. Um, FBI agents who had viewed this film determined it to be a communist propaganda as the story depicts a capitalist banker, Potter, as a villain. So they didn't like it. <laughs> um, let's see. The film is one of the five times that, I'm not going to say her name right, um, Beulia Bondi? Beulah Bondi? I'm going to say that. Okay, so that's the mom of George in this in this movie. This is the fifth time she has played his mother in movies. Oh. She's also played in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington in 1938, Human Hearts in 1938, uh, Vicious Lady in 1938, and The Identity Crisis of 1971. James, wow, everything was 38. Mm. Right. There's three of them in the same year. It's so weird, though. Like, oh, we need someone to play his mom. Go get mm -hmm. her. Um, James Stewart said George was his favorite character that he ever played. Donna Reed's favorite, uh, well, her favorite uh, film of her own, and it was her first starring role. Director Frank Capra often said that this was his favorite of all-time films. Steven Spielberg also cites this film as one of his favorite movies. That's it. Super. Nice. It, Sorry about that. I know it's long. No, no, it's fine. Super. <laughs> and also, due to a legal error, uh, the film went out of copyright in 74, which enabled it to be shown on TV in repeats with no fees. But the oversight ah. was has been corrected by the studio, something George might have something to say about. <laughs> that's from now is that is, oh that's is cool. that when when the movie um finally hit uh, everybody's like everybody loves it because yeah. of that is that when it yeah they just kept playing it over and over again like night of the living dead like you could play it without any copyright so you, nobody had to pay anything it was pretty much open access and that's where it got its wheels yeah i'm pretty sure it was yeah. a flop but then it only like picked up later on in life like, correct as a, yeah as a thing mm -hmm. so. yeah it's time now for final judgment. Are you ready to rubber stamp this bitch? Here's the final judgment. Would that count as a bell? Yeah, that, that's yeah. a bell. That's a bell. <laughs> All right, so so that some angels just got their wings mm. like, like about three or four times during final judgment. Yeah. All right, good for us. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> um. Uh, you can go, Chris. Sure. Um, yeah, it, it holds up. It holds up as much as Hamlet holds up. I mean, um, it's it's straight up a masterpiece. Um, it it doesn't matter about you know what, and it doesn't matter about um, the fact that it's an old timey film where the the fe the lead female character is going to be a homemaker and and she's going to be a mom to as many children as possible, and dad's going to go to work and come home after. Like I know that. That's not the way of things or the way that movies are trying to go now. But the fact of the matter was 1946. What do you expect? Um, it's not yeah. going to be any different. That's what they did. It's not bad or good. That's just how it was. You don't have to... Again, I saw White Christmas today. It's horribly dated for that, but it's still a good movie. That's just how it was. It doesn't make it bad or good. It's just how it was. Um, or, the you know, there's a lot of other things that... That's just how Hollywood was. You don't have to... You can't change it. So... The fact of the matter is that because George Bailey is so identifiable with us in one way or another through all the generations, because of his humanity, we you can identify with something about George Bailey. Um, in it doesn't matter if you can follow Jimmy Stewart and his and his character arc, then um, it should hold up for you. So yeah, of course it holds up. So um, I'm going to go to the still life Maurice Hunt. Oh man! Talk to me. Just, just it's, look, he's just so crazy because I see you three, which I can't see me. That is crazy. Oh, uh, that's all right. That's all right. You're handsome. Uh, You're still handsome. Thanks. It's all good. Thanks. The frozen screen is still working for me. No problem. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I mean it holds up. It, it was a it was a slow burn for me initially, uh, but that second half really starts to gain steam. And like you said, the George Bailey character. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of themes that. It doesn't matter the time and generation. It it resonates because it's the human behavior. And that's one thing that has always been a through line through the beginning of mankind is the behavior that we have. It holds up. That, mm -hmm. <laughs> I we'll just you. leave it there. It holds up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. I'm sorry, man. Um, I'll go. Um, yes, it absolutely does. Um, I think because <laughs> it's just one of those things that if you, like you had said, it, people aren't um, in this movie. There are aspects I'm going, I've never in my life seen a guy pretend to be a donkey throughout the entire yeah. like, throughout my life going he all right no, it's not relatable mm -hmm. that those things are not yeah. um there's just the way that they talk in some ways no but it it doesn't matter it's the overall theme that <clears throat> that if it still hits you somewhere then i think it holds up especially the way it does like you know what i mean like if you feel anything for him Mm -hmm. at the end like it's like you know i mean and then when when that ending comes and and they're, they're all pouring their money out because he did so many he sacrificed so much of himself for other people yeah i mean this this uh we could use a lot more george bailey's in the world how about that sure definitely yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. okay so uh, yeah, I think it definitely holds up. I mean, how can it not? Because they're still playing it every year. And there's so many movies where literally people are watching it in the background. Everybody knows this movie. Even if they haven't seen it, they they know what it's about. And they've, you know, heard certain lines from it. Um, do I think that it would, like, younger generations now, you'd have to probably sit there and force them to sit there and watch it if they didn't grow up with it? Yeah. Would they be a little bit, you know, bored with it? Yeah, they have no attention span. But if you force them to watch it and pay attention to it, it's really good. It's mm -hmm. still such a really good movie. Um, I really enjoyed it. I think I've, like I said, I've always just had it on in the background. I think there's only been about three times where I've watched the whole thing from front to, to back. Um, once with my kids, once with my husband, because he had never seen it. And he was like, this is not a Christmas movie. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> it's like, because like, um, he's used to Hallmark Christmas movies, you know. But um, but this time I enjoyed it even more than the other times that I watched it. Like it just it definitely moves you and it, it grabs you. Um, I think it you know how can it not hold up? Mm -hmm. You know, look at it, it's still going strong after all these years. But <clears throat> there it is. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um. Yeah. Thanks to TikTok, nobody has an attention span. Yeah. This movie's no. Out for yeah. everybody yeah. else. Gracious. Um. All right. So that was our show, everybody. Yeah, <laughs> am I right? Oh yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, that was our show, everyone. And I'd like to thank Maurice Hunt uh, for being here again, thank man. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, tell us all all the stuff you're into. Like, what are you doing? Okay, I'm trying to say it super fast so everybody can hear. <laughs> um, can you? We can hear you good now. Oh, and see you okay. Good. So yeah. quickly, roll the audio drama series. There's three seasons. I'm trying to release an audio book version of it soon, so be on the lookout for that. Also, we have a Sopranos review podcast called Good Earners, reviewing the Sopranos. So that is out. We are on season four. And then also we have another uh, podcast called Another Week in the Books where we discuss issues amongst men uh, from a black perspective. And uh, it's very enlightening and it's very impactful and people are really enjoying it. There's a lot to get from it, even if you're not a man. So uh, those are the things that I'm involved with. Also, well, and... If you're a Twin Peaks and Sopranos fan, I also have an Instagram. Sounds really good. I have an, thank you. Uh, I have an Instagram page called Sopran Peaks. It's a blend between Twin Peaks and Sopranos. So for those, those people that are fans of both shows, wow, I can go check that oh, that's out. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. Tony Soprano yeah. holding a log talking backwards. Hey, it's, it's a, that's you'd that's be surprised. Thing, okay. Just, just, yeah, that's just it. go to the page. It's pretty fun. It's, it's pretty good. All right. I'll check that out. I I've never seen it, but I've heard I've heard so many weird things about it. Like people are like, "Oh, that's yeah. so odd." That I was like, "Yeah, I'll wait then." <laughs> like the, the the Twin Peaks show. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. and then they uh, they they showed they were like Twin Peaks on the Simpsons, and they showed them, and like some girls like slow dancing with a horse. Yep. <laughs> like, <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Boy, the hell, boy. Yeah. All or, that. yeah. Talking backwards. That's so funny. It's yeah. weird. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, all right, man. Well, that was our show, and um, hey, I'd like to thank uh, Chris Martineau and Melanie Howerton for being here as well, and Steve Lavoy for doing our voices, and Draco and the Malfoys for our theme music, and until next time, movies may not age like fine wine, but we drink it anyway. <laughs> Bye.